Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, I do want to point out that I have my phone here. I thought I'd be very modern and have my notes on this rather than folded paper in front of me. But I wanted to say that just so you didn't think I was checking box scores or emails while we were talking. Um, so, of course, uh, you've had a chance so far to meet Stephen. Um, you have been at various times a wine merchant, a wine writer, a wine critic, an author. I'd like to point out this very fine book, which is uh, the subject of much of what we'll talk about today. Um, a restaurateur, you're an educator, a wine judge, wine insider, a wine provocateur. Uh, you worked for auction houses, and now you are a producer of this very fine English sparkling wine. And I would hasten to say that you have often been many of these things, two, three, four of them at once. You <laughs> seem to juggle quite a lot. Um, in the forward to the book, which is really fabulous, you'll have a chance uh, to, uh, if you haven't already bought it, uh, Stephen Spurrier, Wine, A Way of Life, you will be signing, I believe, right I after this. Right after this, yeah. Yeah, which is a terrific opportunity. Um, in the forward, and it's a perfect forward for today, you say, uh, it has, as will be shown, made for a bumpy ride. At the end of George Tabor's book on the judgment at Paris, uh, I, meaning you, am quoted as saying that I am still totally 100% in love with wine, the places where it is produced, and the people who produce it. Uh, for wine has given me more than I could ever have imagined. And I think when we, for all of us who saw the seminar this morning, um, and for those who will see it tomorrow, I suppose, that you really that shows. Yeah, the, uh, Thank you. Yeah, no. Um, so I want to jump into the book and really your life. But before we do that, before we get to the beginning of it all, we should talk about what's happening now, as in Bride Valley, and what we have in the glass. Well, what you have in the, thank you very much for being here. And um, I don't think that David and I are gonna keep going for 90 minutes unless you ask, you ask some questions. So, I mean, if you want to ask anything, do please. Um, Bride Valley Vineyard, was uh, started, our first vines went in in 2009, but it began as an idea back in 1987. My wife um, had bought, um, we had a, when we came back from Paris, um, I had managed before the London property market went completely berserk to buy a nice big house in Clapham, which is south of the river, and it had a big garden, and so, but in the mid 80s, um, my wife said, if I'm gonna have a big house with a garden, I'd rather have it in the country. So I said, okay, but I need a flat in London. So we decided to look for a place in the country and it would be easy for me to find a flat in London. So we looked and looked and looked. And eventually, thanks to Michael Broadbent, we focused on a house in Dorset, which we subsequently bought. And it was a very nice house, but it just had a big garden. And my wife says, well, where am I going to put the horses? <laughs> well, I didn't say yeah, the horses. <laughs> it had a good wine cellar, too. So I was very keen on the house. And my wife said, I can't buy it. There's no room. So the people selling it said, actually, there's a 200-acre farm at the edge of the village coming up for sale. Maybe if you need space, you could buy that. So we went up and looked at the farm. And it was full of chalk. And um, so I just, out of interest, put a couple of blocks of chalk in my pocket. And then it was decided over two or three days that my wife would make an offer for the house and the farm and so on and so forth. And I was still working in Paris in those days. So I took the two blocks of chalk back with me, put them on my desk in front of Michel Bertin, who is the Robert Parker, of, who is my top prof at the time at l'Académie du Vin, and is now the most important influence in French wines. And I said, Michel, where do you think those are from? He looked at them and said, well, Champagne, of course. I said, no, they're from South Dorset. He said, well, you should plant a vineyard. <laughs> so had I planted, I would have planted Pinot Blanc, because I like Pinot Blanc. In fact, the first two white wines I had at the lunch were Pinot Blanc. And, but I didn't. But I did have Michel Laroche from Chablis come over and spend a day with us, a weekend with us. And he took a bucket of soil back to Chablis to have it analyzed. And the analysis came back very suitable for Chardonnay and cool climate grapes like Pinot Noir. Okay, so that was 87. I did nothing about it, thank God. Uh, then time passed, and about 1995, 
I'm invited to the awards of the International Wine and Spirit Competition. And as I walk in, just like you just now, is I'm handing a glass of sparkling wine, and the chairman says, what do you think that is? I said, well, it's champagne, blanc de blanc, certainly chardonnay, probably a Grand Cru, why? Night timber. Night timber, a vineyard in Kent, which has been created by an American from Chicago, who'd only bought the house because he collected old English oak, and oak furniture, I mean old English oak, 13th century, 14th century, 15th century. So he was very well off, so he bought a 15th century house to put his oak furniture collection in. And then he got a bit bored and he liked champagne, so he had some people from Champagne create a vineyard for him. And Nightimber had beaten all the Grand Champagnes. So that was, Nightimber is still the brand leader. Um, with over, well over 100 hectares, they're making over a million bottles a year. And then, in 2004, I founded the Decanter World Wine Awards, and in 2010, Ridgeview, in Sussex, Night Timbers in Kent, um, a winery I'd very much admired, did the same thing. It got the Decanter Platinum Trophy, beating all the sparkling wines all over the world. At that, I thought, okay, you'd, by that time I'd already began to plant the vineyard, but that confirmed everything. But anyway, in 2007, I created a dossier about English sparkling wine, and I took it to Jean-Claude or Jean-Charles Boisset at Vinexpo, and they got very excited, and they sent their top sparkling wine people over, and they wanted to do a 30 hectare, 70, 70 acre joint venture with me, build a winery, so on and so forth, produce 200,000. B uh, uh, bottles, and that would have been a great idea. But when all the analysis came in, and our farm's in a big bowl, and it's south facing just about, but the slopes are quite st steep, the analysis said, well, there are 10 to 12 hectares, which are perfect. The rest, uh, another 20 hectares, which is risky. So the Boisset, the Boisset message was, you and Bella plant the 12 hectares, you buy the vines from Pepinier Guillaume in North Burgundy, who are the greatest um, vineyard nursery in the world. They supply the Romney Conti, Domaine Le Fleuve, Bollinger Le Fleuve, they are the best. You take the grapes to Furley Estate, which was a winery about half an hour from us, and he was the UK winemaker of the year 2012, but this I didn't know when we started. And if all goes well, we'll, uh, we'll buy your wine. So off we went. The first planting went in in 2009, um, it, we hardly planted anything in 2010, a little bit in 2011, 12, 13 was the last planting. And the very first vintage from the 2009 planting, because they're in their th third leaf, so the second year, but they, they, the vines will bud into leaf in their first year. So 2011, there were just a few grapes on the vine. And I gave myself a <coughs> 70th, 70th birthday party at a big local restaurant just looking over the sea for about 120 people. And, um, and it, 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 that lasted until about f f half past five in the afternoon. And then I, we were going to give, we put a, a couple of marquees up on the vineyard. We were going to give a brunch for everyone that we couldn't invite to lunch and the people were staying. So on Sunday morning, I was going to church, because I tend to go to church, in the, the church is just up the street from us. And my wife was, said, what the hell are you doing going to church? There's far much to do here. <laughs> because we, and I said, I've got a lot to thank God for. And so I went to church. And afterwards, saying goodbye to the vicar, who I'd already programmed to say something about the vines, he said, um, <laughs> He said, aren't I supposed to bid your vineyard in sometime soon? I said, yep, two o'clock. So had I not been to church, he wouldn't have been there. And he arrived at two o'clock in his robes, everyone was there. He put up his hands and he blessed the vines as little children of God. <laughs> Which of course they were. And um, lo and behold, they produced 450 bottles of wine. <laughs> so that was great, that was our first vintage. In 2012, we were rained off. But we only had four hectares. Night timber was rained off with uh, almost, uh, almost 100 hectares. Uh, 13, we had a tiny vintage. 14, we had a really lovely vintage, and that's not what you've got in your glass, but that was the first vintage we really got going. We did the Blanc de Blanc, we did the Rosé Bella, named after my wife, we did the Brut Reserve. We were really happy, and I thought, okay, we're motoring. 
15 was so damn cold, and this is where we come to for the Cremant, that we made a tiny amount of rosé. The way we make rosé is by bringing the Pinot Noir grapes to Folio State and having him macerate them for 36 hours and then press them very, very slowly. And the juice that runs off is darker than the color of rosé we need. This is what the French call the saigné process. Uh, sang in French is blood, saigné is to bleed. And so you bleed the color out of the Pinot Noir skins. And we arrive at a rosé which is darker than we need, so we then blend in 30 or 40 percent of Chardonnay to bring the color down. Okay. And then the rest of the grapes came in. It was very cold. We stopped picking when the sugars, with the potential alcohol, dropped below seven degrees alcohol. And we chaptalized up a bit. The acidity was 12.5. So we come pre-blending to May or June 2016, and Ian Edwards, the winemaker of Folio Estate, said, Stephen, we can't make a sparkling wine out of this. The acidity is too high, the, acid, the, the, the alcohol is too low, it, we can't do it. So I said, what do I do? Just pour it away? He said, no, no, you wait until 16 and we'll make a blend. Okay, so 16 comes around, small vintage, better quality, we make a blend, which is what you've got here. And then I was faced with what... Well, first of all, I said, to tasting the blend we'd made, it was still 10.5 degrees of, of, of acid. And I said, Ian, this is too green. This is too green. The full sparkling wine of Champagne, the full sparkling fizz of Champagne is going to be too aggressive. Can you make a cremor? And Cremant, in its old-fashioned word, Cremant means creamy in French. And it has one-third less fizz than Champagne. And so he said, of course I can make a Cremant. And so I requested that he make a Cremant. And then I was faced by the idea of what I would call it. And I had no intention of ever putting the words NV on any of my wines. Because although NV means non-vintage, it's not what I'm about. Non-vintage in the classic French style, Champagne style, is you have a lot of reserve wines and you blend them in with your current vintage and you make a non-vintage. I want to make a vintage every year and to sell it as the vintage year. And I have no intention of keeping reserve wines because I don't want to. And in the immortal words of... Um, of the winemaker at, at Dom Perignon, Richard Geoffroy. Dom Perignon is now going to be made every year. Roder Cristal is only made when they have a perfect year, which means every other year. <laughs> <laughs> but Richard, Richard Geoffroy is now, three years ago, he made the decision to make Dom Perignon every year. And I figured that out. And I said, Richard, you're going to make Dom Perignon every year, aren't you? He said, Mon cher Stephen, we have to witness the vintage. Okay, so I, my view at Bride Valley is we should witness the vintage. So I wasn't going to call this non-vintage, but I admit on the back label that it is a blend of 15 and 16. And so once getting to selling it, my uh, um, distributor said, what are you going to call it? I said, I'm going to call it Cremor, of course, because that's what it is. It was 3.6 bars of fizz as opposed to 6. And he said the European rules won't allow you to do that because it's a French word. So I contact the European authorities and I said we're allowed to call our wines Brut, Brut in this country. And my wine was Brut Reserve and that is French, Brut. The reply came back, yes, but England, England always also uses that for aftershave. <laughs> so it, it's in the, public, in the public domain. So I then thought, well, I'll call it Cremor anyway and have them take me to court, I'll get a huge publicity, then I can call it CR dot 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 NT. But in the meantime, somebody said, Stephen, the European rules are that if you have a place of origin, you can get an appellation, a PDO, a, a, a protected denomination of origin. So I applied for Dorset Cremon, which is what you've got. And this is not only the first English Cremant, it is only the third English Appellation. So, it is, it's, 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 um, I'll just tell you what it is, it's about 65% Chardonnay, 
and 30% uh, 30, 30 Pinot Noir, 5% Pinot Meunier. It's 10.5 degrees of acidity. It's got a dosage of nine, and my wines are normally dosed at eight or even less because I want to preserve the precision of the fruit. And I think you'll find there's no getting away from the acidity in this. It's Granny Smith acidity. I don't recommend anyone drinks more than two glasses at a trot because it's going to hit your stomach. But you do get on the palate, it does cream. The impression on the palate is not aggressive. It creams the first impression of the fizz is that it flows, which Cremor should do, and then the acidity kicks in, but the fruit is there as well. Anyway, cheers. Cheers. So what's it like to be on the other side of the table? Because you've worn so many hats in the trade, but now uh, to be selling and well, put wearing, your wine up Well, wearing in hats in the trade, I remember when I, I had the wine shop and then I opened the wine school, and so that was went down pretty well with the French, with with the French critics. And then I <coughs> opened a opened a restaurant, and um, the top French critic Robert Cortine didn't approve of English people opening restaurants. <laughs> so he described me in Le Monde as Monsieur un peu tout chatou, which means a jack of all trades. So we know the jack of all trades is master of none. Well, he was right. I should never have opened a restaurant. Um, but anyway, so that's wearing lots of hats at the same time. Um, as regards being on this side of the table, so to speak, and the last chapter in my book is called Poacher Turn Gamekeeper. When the Boisset people, George Legrand from Boisset, came to see me first, I said, George, I'm just going to make one wine because I don't want to bother with a blonde de blanc, I don't want to have a rosé, I'm just going to make a single sparkling wine from, from this vineyard. And he said, you're crazy. And I said, well, why? What's your argument? He said, you've never been on the selling side of the table before, have you? I said, no. I said, okay, if you have one wine, the only question you can ask is, do you like my wine? If you have two or three or even four wines, the question you ask is, which of my wines do you prefer? <laughs> Very simple. So I created three wines. Uh, and so that, that, that is, but it, it's most interesting being on the other side of the table because all my life I was well, a trainee, but once I had, had shops of my own, I was a wine buyer and I only bought wines I liked because then I thought my clients would like them. And, but to buy the wines, I had to go and taste wines all over France and then all over the world. And so I was naturally criticizing their wines and people were saying, Mr. Spurrier, what do you think? And so I was <coughs> telling them what I thought. And uh, the kind of get out line in French is pas mal, which means not bad. Pas mal can mean a really pretty awful or surprisingly good. But Pamal <laughs> Pamal is a get out line. But 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 um, uh, or Pasimal is better than you thought it might be. But but anyway there was always but uh, and, and so I I was on the other side of the table and it's most interesting having criticisms of the wines that, that carry my name because I have to respond to them. You can't just say I'm sorry you're wrong and so you're you're not you're not one of my clients anyway. So. And it's interesting, the style of Bright Valley is very precise. It's very vertical. It, 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 it's always high in acidity. We have a cool climate. And I always describe our wines as aperitif wines. They do not go with food. Well, the rosé does, can go with a dessert, but it has to be a fruit dessert. When I got the award at the Decanter Man of the Year Award in 2017, Decanter threw a lunch for me at the Gavroche restaurant, which is the best French restaurant in London. And they served Rosé Bella, named after my wife, 2014, with a damson fruit tart. And damson is the most acidic of all the plum family. And that worked wonderfully. But this wine is simply not with food. This is a complete aperitif wine. Uh, and so that's the precise style that I want. And um, I just have to see that, I have to admit and accept that a lot of people don't like that very tight style of wine, but, which I happen, to, I happen to like. Anyway, there it is. You mentioned Night Timber earlier. Yeah. I just point out that um, in 2005 at Domaine Duran, we had a wonderful harvest intern in Sherry Spriggs. Her uh, partner, Brad, was across the street at Domaine Serene, and they were hired over the phone by the mm. 
yeah. owner to become the winemakers where they've been ever since. So, Jerry, so, yeah. 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 so as Canadians, yeah. they could easily move uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. To, to the UK. So more Oregon um, connections. So I did want to dive into the, the book a bit if, and to, to go back. Um, it is an incredibly honest book. You are brutal about uh, the things that happen in your in your life and the and the, and the honesty. Um, uh, first, the title itself it's, it's very specific. Wine, a way of life. How did that come to you? Well, wine is the only job I've ever had. So, um, and it 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 has. Well, I mean, it 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 has been a way of life. Um, I can't, um, <clears throat> I can't hide, and I do not hide in, in the book, that I, I have, I had a privileged upbringing. There was, I mean, I went to the right schools, there was always money around, all that kind of stuff. So I, I came from a privileged background. The great advantage I had is that I have an elder brother, and he'll be 80 at the end of August, so I'm going to his 80th birthday party. In England, probably not in now in my, my sons and certainly not for my grandson's generation, but in those days, we still had primogeniture, which meant that the family estates went to the eldest son and the second son, of course, the girls got nothing. The girls were supposed to marry a rich husband. But, but, um, and so I knew from my teens that I was going to be completely free, that although my elder brother was going to get the estates, he also was going to have the responsibility. And I knew that I had no responsibility to do anything except get a job and do my own, my own thing. Um, and I had this Damascene conversion, which I've written about in the book. Uh, in 1954, Christmas Eve dinner at the family estate, my grandfather was still alive, uh, all in black tie, but it was my first Christmas Eve dinner in Long Trousers. I'd just gone to boarding school. And um, it came around to the end of dinner, and the port was being served. And my grandfather said, I think you're old enough for a glass of port. So he summoned the butler. The butler brought me a glass. The decanter came around the table. I poured myself a glass of this, this wine. It completely knocked my socks off. So I said, gosh, Grandpa, what's that? Coburn's 08, my boy. And I can tell you that impression of that wine was so dramatic that, and also at the time I collected stamps, a lot of my contemporaries did, and the, the, the wine had the connection with stamps because it had a country, it had a date, it had a name, it had an image. And quite frankly, from that moment, during my geographic and my history lessons at school, I searched out what I could learn about wine. So I was learning about wine even before I was, I, was not, I was not drinking it. And then my parents used to take my brother and I to Europe with them, to France and Italy. Um, under the socialist government in the 1950s, uh, the amount of money you could take out of the country per person was 50 pounds. Well, that worth at least maybe a thousand pounds today. But that was it. But if you took a child, you could take 25 pounds. So there was this kind of rent-a-child thing. And so, so my, my, parents, my parents took, took my older brother and, and, and me, and they used to stay in the Georges Sank, and we used to stay in some pension somewhere. So. But they did take us to the restaurants with them. So in the cafes and brasseries in Paris and in the trattorias in Italy, I saw in front of me the conviviality of wine. And here were the families drinking, talking, chatting, wine being poured, all that kind of stuff. So the blend of the intellectuality of wine, which I'd been learning about from books, and the conviviality of wine just made it straight plain to me that that was going to be what I was going to do in my life. So I was at the London School of Economics. I joined the LSE Wine Society. I tasted a bit of wine. By that time, I was, in my, I was 18, so able to drink wine. Went to a lot of wine bars and knew that I was going to go into the wine trade. So that's what I did. You, you describe a very casual relationship with school. With what? With school. 
<laughs> the, yeah. <laughs> well, uh, I think the problem with rugby school, well, where I was, um, it was very, it was very restricting, very controlling, and that's not in my character. And um, so I passed exams. That was easy because if you work hard, you pass exams. The rest of the time, I tried to be as uh, disruptive as I could. <laughs> so I formed the Rugby School Architectural Society. And when they realized I could take a whole bus of people out to Oxford and to see the, the, the uh, they, they realized I was, I was controlling something they didn't want control. So they shut that down. I created the Rugby School Jazz Society. They shut that down immediately. <laughs> anyway, they, they fi I finally got out of rugby. And I had a place at Cambridge. And because I'd passed all the right exams. And I told my father, I'm not going to Cambridge. I'm so fed up with this cap and gown stuff, saluting the masters. I'm out of there. I'm going to London to grow up. And I was a very young, I was always the youngest boy in the school because I was born in October. So I left school before, before I was 18. And I said, Daddy, I'm going to London to grow up. He said, you've got to go to university. And I said, sure. So he booked me into the LSE. I, the exams were OK. And um, he knew that I was bad at math. And this was his getting back at me for having not gone to, to Cambridge, which is where he wanted me to go. And um, I didn't, to go, didn't need to go to Cambridge because I was born in Cambridge, so I already knew which university I supported. So there was, there was no reason for me to go to Cambridge. <laughs> anyway, I went, I, went to the, I went to the LSE, and I plowed through the exams. I failed my first year. I did it again. I got past it. But there was, growing up in London was just perfect. London in the early 60s was a growing up experience, I can tell you. But I was glad to get out of school. And so then you accept a job with the oldest wine merchant in London. So this is, we're about 1964 now. Yeah, yeah. I love the description. I don't know if any of you recognize this from your own wine buying experiences. Uh, this is, we're talking about Christopher's. Mm. Mm. Quote, clients entered to be received by an elegantly dressed young man at a polished mahogany desk and asked to sit in a comfortable chair to discuss their needs. <laughs> That's not the experience I usually have at a wine store. Yeah, well, they didn't do anything so vulgar as having bottles in the window. They were in, they were in German Street, and they might have had a bottle, just some, some dusty bottle of 18th century Madeira or something like that. No, 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 they, this was bespoke, bespoke to a, a bespoke degree. And um, when I went for my interview, um, I was sat down in front of the managing director, and um, he said, where were you at school? And I said, rugby. So the rugby is one of the top four schools. You've got Eton, Harrow, Winchester, and rugby. And he said, oh dear, we normally only employ Etonians. And so that, anyway, they employed me. But that, that was just the atmosphere. It was so elitist. And um, I knew that I did a year's work as a trainee, as a kind of cellar rat for them. And I did learn a lot, but then the absolute joy, I did nine months abroad in, in France and Germany and Spain and Portugal, um, really learning the trade from the vineyards up. And that was, that was an unbelievable experience, unbelievable. Which they asked you to do at your own expense. Well, yes. I. <laughs> There are many advantages to having money. The most advantage, biggest advantage is complete independence. And I was a trainee, and I was being sent to these very grand old established companies to be a trainee. And I knew that if I went along with the standard thing, which is very good, I would still learn a lot, I would be in the cellars, and maybe I wouldn't learn as much as I should. So I wrote to all these companies who were employing me, and I said, I am costing you money. You are teaching me about wine. Therefore, my solution is that you don't pay me, because it will be my pleasure to learn about wine at my expense with you. The result was, and I had a couple of my colleagues there, and we weren't always working for the same people. Um, at about 11 o'clock, or well, maybe 12 o'clock, there was a message, uh, Mrs. Spurrier, come up to the office. And I used to 
uh, attend the tastings, wash the glasses afterwards, and then every now and then was, uh, Mrs. Puri, why don't you join us for lunch? Meanwhile, my colleagues were working downstairs because paid trainees do not join the bosses for lunch. Okay. And so I went to Chateau Pontecane and we discussed the 28th and the 29th. I went with uh, Jacques Calvé and we talked about uh, uh, Cheval Blanc 1947. It was a good trade. It cost me 2,000 2, pounds worth with a huge amount more today. It was the best trade I ever did because I was treated as a, an equal and not as a servant. <coughs> so, <laughs> In the book, the themes that I really enjoyed, it's, you know, it's people, first yeah. and foremost. It's really yeah. a diary of, of it's, in fact, it's a very extensive diary. Do you keep notes like this? No, it was really just, just memory. Dear God, wow. Okay, so because you, the, the, the specificity about what you ate, what the wines were that were served, mm. the people that were there, it's a fantastic mm. diary, yeah, all yeah. on the way of so many of the important people in, in the wine trade. And I did keep the menus, yeah. Yeah, I did keep the menus, yeah. <laughs> there we go. There, and, you, and you're very generous about the people that you admire. Uh, yeah. Tommy Layton, uh, folks, the people that some we might have met through IPNC, like a Michael Broadment, mm. others that, you know, an Alexis Lachine that we would not have met, um, this sort of thing. But you're very, you're very, very generous about the people along the way. There's travel, there's adventure, there's uh, a lot of trust, a lot of misplaced trust. Mm. You talk about this um, along the way. And there's a tremendous amount of humor and cleverness, which is why I'm glad for this format, this is a much smaller, more casual uh, piece that will give people a chance to ask questions if you have them along the way. I hope you do. Because um, uh, that really is such the, the thread in the book is, is the, the people you meet in the adventure, which I think people, when they, if they know you only as uh, the judgment at Paris or yeah, certain yeah. events, but they don't, when they read the book, they see um, really how wild it is that you would be at a very young age you know, moving to France um, at a time before the EU. It wasn't wasn't done mm. as much. Uh, the fact that you would own, open a wine shop and a lot of humor uh, mm. around that. Your first ad, I believe, that you took out after <laughs> opening your store. It's quite brilliant. Well, uh, um, I think I've been lucky enough to always been able to not do what I wanted, but to do, to do something different has never has never posed a problem for me. I've made masses of mistakes. I mean, the book is, as I said, a rocky ride. Um, but I remember when, I, when my wife and I got engaged in, in, I think, October or November 1967, and I'd already bought a, 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 a property um, in, the, in the Var, in the south of France, but it had a ruin on it. There was no house, but it just had a few walls standing. And um, I had commissioned a plan to rebuild the house, to build a very substantial house. Um, and I said to my future wife, I said, and we already had a house in, in London, a very nice, very nice house. And I said, she said, of course, we're going to live in London. I said, no, we're going we're to move to Provence. And she said, hey, that's the property that I hear you bought. Yeah, I said, we're going to move to Provence. We're, we're going to, the house will be, will be rebuilt. And uh, so she said, what are you going to do down there? Well, I said, I, I've left the wine business temporarily. I'm going to go into the antiques business, which is my other love is art and antiques. And I'm just going to collect antiques and every single stick of furniture and every single painting in the house would be for sale. I will just furnish the house with things I like and hope people will come in and buy them. And she said, why not? And so for about the first 20 years of our marriage, moving to Paris, buying a barge, instead of moving into an apartment, all these sensible things people do, her reaction was, why not? Until about um, 20 or so years ago, she stopped saying that. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, um, so, I mean, w w w women, get control eventually. <laughs> uh, but, but it was, I mean, I, uh, there was never a problem to me uh, to do something I wanted if I thought it was a, if I thought it was a good idea at the time. <laughs> Put it that way. And so in 1971, you buy the, yeah. the shop. Yeah. It's here, it's also on the cover of your uh, IPNC <coughs> booklet. Chief, you're, 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 you're now going to be poured out the Dorset Pinot Noir, so you please finish your 
Your glass, yeah. So you, you buy the shop in 1971. Yeah. And you, this is really quite a, a revolutionary event. Um, and the wine business was different then in terms of the, the trade and retail and such like that. Maybe you would want to set the scene for buying the shop and your entry into, into the Paris wine trade. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was walking, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do in Paris because the, the, rebuilding, the rebuilding of the huge house that I designed, had designed for me um, didn't happen. I had a crooked architect and you know, you're young, you've got tons of money, it's just you're ripped off entirely. We did build the swimming pool. I pasted out. Um, I, didn't, I didn't measure it out, I just pasted out what I thought would be a nice size pool. It turned out to be 18 meters by 10. We surrounded it by Carrara marble and um, it was a really lovely swimming pool. Uh, and I hadn't figured out where we were going to get the water from. Anyway, we re <laughs> we dug down very deeply and got our own water supply, but that cost a bit of money. So, and we built, but, but anyway, it didn't work out. So my wife says, what are we going to do now? And I said, right, we're going to move to Paris and I'll go back into the wine trade. So we moved to Paris, and, um, but there's no wine trade in the classic English wine trade terms. There's just a lot of shops. Every corner had a n n n n n Nicola shop, a lot of little wine shops. It's a completely corrupt wholesale business and no wine trade. So walking up a little Mews street, a little passageway near the Madeleine with a friend of mine, we passed a wine shop. And I said, Christopher, that's my dream. A little shop like that, I know exactly what I could do with it. And so he grabs me, we were going up to lunch at the, at the restaurant, which I subsequently bought. And he grabs me in, and I look around the walls, and the, the, the wines are pretty boring, but okay. And the madame, lady behind the counter says, may I sell you something? And my friend Christopher says, my friend would like to buy your shop. And she says, it's for sale. <laughs> so every now and then you have a bit of luck like that. So we meet, we do the deal, we get the price, and then she has second thoughts. And because her husband had been a very good caviste, a very good wine merchant, and he died of cancer two years previously, and she just felt that a young Englishman who didn't speak good French, and there was no evidence for her that I knew anything about wine, would not be able to carry on the the, the reputation of her husband. So once again, using money as an advantage tool, I said, okay, Madame Fougere, here's the deal. We were October the 1st. I said, I'll work for you for six months for nothing. And if you think after six months I'm able to take over, I can, can honor your husband's reputation, we'll do the deal. If not, I'll walk away. Of course, that was fantastic during those six months. I learned much better French, I got to know exactly what I wanted to do with the place. Uh, I worked like a slave, I can tell you. In those days, I was a livreur, I delivered all the cases of wine and, and, and it was 15 bottles of litres, 15 litres of vin in air and 10 litres of water in a single case that probably 25 kilos, if not 30 kilos, which I had to take up in my arms up the servant's staircase because in those days in Paris delivery boys were not allowed to use the lift. And then you, you go in and then you change them all for empty bottles. Or so, so, but that, those six months I got to know exactly what I was going to do with the shop. And um, <clears throat> I was allowed to take it over on the 1st of April, April Fool's Day, 1971. <laughs> I placed an advertisement in the Herald Tribune which just read, your wine merchant speaks English, call Stephen Spurrier. <laughs> uh, and at those days, Paris was very much an international city, it's certainly international now, but it was an international financial city. And all the American banks were there, all the American law firms were there, and they were all around the Madeleine. It was a piece of cake. And so I got this Anglo-Saxon, principally American clientele. And about two days after I bought the shop, because we used to bottle our own wine, the tanker, little tanker truck used to appear and pump vin in air into the vats above the shop and we bottled it by hand. And so the representant from the supplier 
came and said, Mrs. Perry, I'm very pleased that you bought Manor Fusier shop. I hope we're going to continue. And said, no, we're not. I said, the, the tanks are going. We're going tomorrow. And he looked a little bit downcast. He said, you're going to lose half your clientele. I said, that's the half I want to lose. <laughs> <laughs> and because what, uh, what did I want to do is supplying vin vin to people who, who, I mean, uh, you know, not my clientele. So bit by bit, um, and I, I did know exactly what I wanted to do. And there were two or three other good wine, top wine merchants in Paris. There was Monsieur Legrand, there was Monsieur Bess, and Monsieur Chaudet. And Monsieur Legrand was on my side of town, on the right bank, no, on the, the right bank. And so I got to know him, and we did subsequently some very interesting things together. But I wasn't phased at all. I knew I could get a new clientele, and I knew I did not want to sell Val Ordinaire. So that was, that was it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was it, just that small yeah, bracket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then in 1973, you yeah. start Académie du Vin. Yeah, well then the, I, used to give, I, I used to give tastings in the evenings. The, my American clientele, or English clientele, and a few French people used to come by and say, um, well, used to come by and bottle of, buy, buy a couple of bottles of wine. But they say, what's, uh, what's new? And I always had something that I'd open. And so I showed them the wine with a little bit of information. And one of them said, you know, Stephen, if you could put this into a structured fashion, we'd love to do a wine course. We'd love to learn about wine. And um, I'd met a great friend called John Winroth, who was the wine writer for the Herald Tribune. And he was giving wine courses in the backs of cafes to junior year abroad students coming in from America. And um, I said, John, look, if I can get the the place next door, which I knew was coming up for sale, uh, we could open a wine school. And you do the, you, you do the teaching, and, and sort of all the wines come from the shop. So we set that as an idea. The place came up. I managed to buy it for a very low price at auction. And I was going to call it L'Ambassade du Vin, because to me, I was, I was a wine communicator. And so the wine embassy was what I was. I was an ambassador for wine. The name L'Ambassade du Vin had been taken by someone else. So the next one down was L'Académie du Vin, the wine school. And uh, an academy in, in England and probably in America is a school you go to. An academy in France is a high level, uh, it's a high level something that you aspire to. So L'Académie Française, you have to be 90 before you're allowed through the doors. Uh, and, and so the name L'Académie du Vin, no one had taken it because they had never allied the name Academy in its French sense to wine because wine was a very popular drink. So I got the name L'Academie du Vin, wine school, and we opened in 1973 and it was, we were the only game in town. And so this was why, or how, why, I was able to do the judgment of the tasting which became known as the judgment of Paris because the vintners from California and um, American journalists used to come to La Cadre de Vin with California wines and just I'd say, I'd like you to taste these wines. Maybe you've been, and so we were, knocked, we were knocked out by them, the quality of the Chardonnays, the quality of the Cabernets. And so I said to my partner at the time, Patricia Gallagher, who is American, I said, we've got to do something about this we, because we'd always, we were giving tastings, we really were the only game in town. We were giving tastings of anything we wanted to think about, Spanish wine, Chilean wine, all that kind of stuff. And I said, Patricia, we've got to get recognition for these wines. And so she took her September holidays, went to California, checked out some wineries, came back saying, absolutely, we must do it. And so we did it. Yeah. So you are, to reiterate what you said earlier today, that that you were not in the sad, broken position that the movie portrayed. Um, the movie Bottle Shock, I think mm -hmm. for those of you who were in the seminar earlier today, might have detected a note of pique um, <laughs> that, uh, about the portrayal and, and, and frankly the absolute lack of respect in consulting you. Mm. And, and the fact that, because um, it's something we, we had the pleasure of seeing each other about a month ago, and uh, the idea that, that uh, someone would, would make your life story without you is mm. outrageous enough. But, and then get all of it wrong, and the portrayal in the movie is so far different than what was happening in your life at the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the true. and uh, the and as you said, you know, the the fact that you were successful, you look at the at the roster of 
mm. judges. It's a very impressive well, list. Well, we were we were the most we were incredibly well respected because we had never asked for money from anybody. Uh, we were holding events. Uh, well, people used to we used to charge for them, but we were we were in a way revolutionized the Parisian wine trade. And in the way that Michel Guerard and La Nouveau Cuisine revolutionized French cuisine in the 1970s. And so when I said to Patricia, to draw attention to the quality coming out of California, we have to have them tasted by the best judges in France. And so we ticked off a few boxes, Aubert de Villene from the Romilly Conti, Pierre Tarry, who owned Chateau Gisco, Raymond Oliver, the great chef from the Grand Refort, uh, Jean-Claude Vrignard from the restaurant Taillevant, uh, Christian Vanneke, the head sommelier at La Tour d'Argent, um, and so on and so forth. Okay. So we got the, these, these nine people signed up. Uh, um, oh yeah, Odette Kahn, the owner of the Revue de Vin de France, Pierre Brejoux, the head of the Institut de Zaplas and Contrôle, they signed up because they knew we wouldn't have asked them if it wasn't worth their while turning up. So I went to California to make the final selection, which wasn't easy. It wasn't as easy as I thought. Um, I went to see Joe Heights at Heights, and he was not, he didn't want to see me. Uh, he said, why, you, why do you want to come? I don't sell to France, and I, don't, I, I said, I, because I said, I'm interested in, in tasting your wines. And he was no, no, not terribly welcoming. And so he said, well, since you're here, you better taste a white and a red. So it, I tasted his Chardonnay. And I said, Mr. Hyde, this reminds me of a Merceau Charm. And he said, Merceau is my wife's favorite wine. From that moment, we got on fine. <laughs> so I got Heights. Then I rang Ridge. And I, I was staying up in north of, north of San Francisco at the time. And Ridge is down in Santa Clara. And I rang Ridge. And I gave him the spiel. I said, I want to come and taste your wine. We said, I want to put it in a, a tasting in Paris. We don't receive visitors, and we certainly don't want our wine uh, 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 tasted by the French. <laughs> so, and don't bother to come. So I turned up anyway, and um, got out of my car, and there was Dave Banyan, who was Paul Draper's um, um, uh, colleague, he said, you're the guys I told not to come. I said, that's right. <laughs> so we tasted the wine and we got on fine. So anyway, that, 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 but it wasn't as simple as you might think. So anyway, we get the wines. The wines, are, this is about the only true thing in the movie. Uh, the wines are hand carried over by a group. It was a wine and tennis tour organized by uh, Diane um, Dickinson. And Andre Cherchev was on the tour. There was a wine and tennis tour. And there were 23 of them, and they carried 24 bottles of wine with them. And one broke, so that was easy. 23 bottles, 23 people. And if they hadn't done that, I would not have gotten the wines into France, because there was no import allocation for <coughs> California wine. And so about a fortnight before the tasting was due to happen, everything was lined up. I said to Patricia, I'm worried. We got the best judges, we got the best wines, but the judges, with one exception, Ober de Villene, who is married to a girl from California, from San Francisco, only Ober will have ever tasted California wine before. The rest of the judges will know that California is on the west coast, somewhere north of Mexico, yeah. and they will think it's a hot country. Totally right. And they will then put in their heads Spain, or south of uh, uh, Italy, and they will not give the wines the respect they deserve. I said, I'm going to turn it into a blind tasting with the best from Burgundy and the best from Bordeaux from my shop. And Patricia said, well, that's not what, not what they've been asked to do. I said, don't worry. On the day, I'll fix it. <laughs> so I choose Mouton Rothschild 70, uh, Aubryon 71, no, Aubryon 70, Monroe 71 and Leo Alaska 71 and the, the white burgundies are Pouli Morache Premier Cru, Mercer Premier Cru, Bone Clay de Mouche and Butter Morache. Fine. The judges turn up and I say, you have come to taste California wine. And I think it could be 
more instinct perhaps to taste them blind against the best from Burgundy and the best from Bordeaux. But I have to have your agreement because this is not what you're here for. And if they said no, I could have done it. They said, part of problem. <laughs> so the rest is history. So that's, that's what happened. And it was the judgment of Paris. The, the white wines, it was very simple. Uh, Chateau Montelena got six votes to be top wine. Chalonne, which I personally thought would come top, got three. So not a single French judge put a white burgundy in the top, um, in the top place. I announced the results of the whites while the reds were being prepared. That was sort of a mistake. That was a little bit shocking to everybody. But what it did do, it put firmly into their minds they were not going to have that happen again with the reds. <laughs> and so when they realized by tasting that a wine was from California, they slammed it. We were marking out of 20. Sometimes wines got three and four. They really took it apart. However, the ranking Stagsley snuck in by half a point. And Odette Kahn, the owner of the Rue de Vannes de France, knew exactly what would happen. She stood up and she demanded her notes back. And she had voted for both the Montelena and the Staxi. And I said, Madame Kahn, you agreed to take part in this. They're no longer your notes. They're my notes. <laughs> she then wrote an article in her magazine saying it had been faked and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, but that was the judgment of Paris. Now, since I talk, that's, this is the judgment of Dorset. <laughs> this, this, is, this, is a well Dor, this is a Pinot Noir. I always told myself that if ever my vineyard could produce a, still, produce a vintage from which I can make a still wine, I would do it. And the potential sugars last year vintage were 11.5. On the first day of the vintage, we picked this Pinot Noir at 11.5. We chapitalized it up to 12.5. It's still in tank. We've, I bought a single American barrel, 10% is going to barrel. But this is Dorset Pinot Noir, uh, the, uh, the Dijon clones. So you, you know all about Pinot Noir. I don't have to tell you how to taste this wine. What I do want, though, is your opinion of it. Kurt, come on. Pas mal. Pas mal. Bravo. Bravo. It's, it's lovely. Bravo. It, bravo. It, it, it's light, but it's, it's lovely. It's light. Yeah, it's light. Uh, it's going to spend, this is a tank sample. It's going to be bottled in December. Another 10% will go into work. It is light, um, but it is very pure Pinot Noir. And um, I'm sort of quite happy with it. I, I, I think it's, a, 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 and it's, the vines are five years old. So it, it's, there's, there's, I think we got a very good vintage on the vines, very prolific vintage on the vines. As the vines get older, the quality of the juice is, gets much more, uh, much more complex, much more, much more texture. And so I feel that obviously in poor vintages we can't do it. But if we can get the sugars up to 10 or 10.5 10 .10 degrees, we're going to still, we're going to continue to make still wine because we can chapitalize up to 12. But I'm, I re I'm really happy the way that's turned out and I'm very happy to present it to you today because it's something you won't ever have, t have <laughs> tasted before in your lives. I have a yes. question. Well, you said you welcome questions along the way. Absolutely. So um, over the years, my wife and I have visited quite a few wineries in France and other parts of Europe and I was astounded how almost every winemaker said they couldn't, they couldn't get wines from other regions of France where they lived, and therefore knew relatively little about the, the other French regions, didn't know much about, didn't know many of the winemakers there. Sometimes my wife, who enjoyed um, technical matters mm. like that, would tell them what somebody was doing in another part of France, and they'd say, really? That's, that's amazing. Have you... That's, that, that's, entirely, that's entirely changed. The, um, the, younger, the younger generation, it changed about 20 years ago, if not more. And I think the Judgment of Paris was very instrumental in that. But you're telling you what you and your wife saw. In the 1970s, the Burgundians didn't even taste wines from the next village. <laughs> no, no. Um, and so in, in, in Bordeaux they drank Bordeaux, in Burgundy they drank Burgundy, in Beaujolais they drank Beaujolais, um, and so on and so forth. It was, 
it was quite extraordinary. There was very little. Uh, <laughs> Pierre Henri Gaget, Thibault, who, those of you who this morning, Thibault's father, said, um, until about 15 years ago, we thought Bordeaux was a color. <laughs> rather, like, rather like magenta or purple. <laughs> so, so that was a, but I tell you a wonderful, a wonderful comment. I had a very great friend called Martin Bamford who used to run an English show in Chateau in the Baron called Chateau Luden. And Martin was a great Bordeaux purist, and, um, but total Medoc. And he, he appreciated the wines from the right bank. So Cheval Blanc, Petrus, Vieux Chateau Sertan, that, that was OK. And so I came back. I was staying at Luden. I came back after a day on the right bank, and I'd been to Vieux Chateau Sertan and, and Cheval Blanc. And, said, and I came back raving about the right bank wines, basically Merlot, okay, as opposed to Cabernet Sauvignon. And I said, Martin, the right bank wines are really fantastic. He said, if you think so. <laughs> and I said, well, um, yes, they're supposed to appeal to the emotion and the Merox appeal to the head. He said, that's correct. And I said, rather like Burgundy appeals to the emotion. He said, yes, you don't have to be very bright to like Burgundy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, that, that, Wow. That's good. Um, I did want to point out that the Pinot Noir was hand carried by Stephen here. Uh, so, so, yeah. so, so, it's, so it's just arrived. Yeah. Um, there are a couple other topics I want to get into, but I want to see if there are other questions at the moment. We want to make sure everyone has. Yes, please. I'm just curious about uh, other areas of the world that you see are producing wines at the top of the heap, besides uh, France and you know, California. Well, I mean, I think Chile, certainly Argentina, South Africa, Australia, of course. It's a much easier question is to, to find the other parts of the world which are not producing wines, which are at the top of the heap. And in that bracket, I'd put Thailand, <laughs> China, <laughs> Vietnam. <laughs> um, no, it's, if, vineyards, if vineyards are capable of being planted, I'd that's it, the soil and the climate is capable of planting noble grape varieties. And there are people capable of allowing the grapes to express themselves without exaggerating it, the wines will be very good. It's simple as that. So I think I think the 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 the, 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 the range of worldwide wines is is quite extraordinary. I mean it, it, it's it's um, I, I mean no one well few people except the mass producers are making bad wine now because they know there's no market for it. They're all competing with each other. The first growths and the extra super, the sort of um, Screaming Eagles, all that kind of stuff, uh, uh, Bill Harlan, they're in a world of their own. But every other wine has to compete for, the, for your buck. And therefore, they have to be as good as they can possibly be. It's a golden age. It really is a golden age for wine drinkers. It's interesting that, that the Judgment at Paris format has been used many, many, many times since. Well, what the Judgment of Paris did, the most important thing, is, is I mean, it, it, it put California on the map. It, it actually, the other important thing it did, the young, we're talking about the young generation. The younger generation went to California to see what the hell was going on. And they saw there was a lot of money going into the wineries. There was no money going into investment in France because the vineyards weren't making money. Um, <clears throat> I remember I used to spend the vintages at Leo Barton. And Longo Barton is a lovely chateau. And Ronald Barton told me during the 70 vintage, she said, Stephen, this is such a good vintage and the quantity. I think with this vintage, we can repair the roof of the chateau. And it's not as though they were having buckets catching the drips, but you know, it needed repair. And so I was down again in the 71 vintage, and much the same thing, less concentration, but nice volume. And I said, well, Ronald, what about this? He said, well, this vintage, I can repair the roof on the cellar. 
there was no money to invest. And if you don't invest, you can't make good wine. Um, and so what people saw in California was massive investment going in and really seat of the pants trying to do the best possible thing. And it's no coincidence that the first vintage of Opus 1 was 1979. And Baron Philippe de Rothschild would not have considered going in with Robert Mondavi until the judgment of Paris showed him what was going on there. But the most important thing the judgment of Paris did, it created a template whereby unknown wines could go up against <coughs> unknown wines of quality, could go up against known wines of quality, to be judged blind by judges. And if the judges were of quality, the opinion of the judges would be respected. So it completely opened the playing field. Another question. Um, I came to love Burgundies in the 80s, and I loved the fact, well, they were still an old style, sort of a little unpredictable, maybe a little bread, whatever, quite original. And it seemed to me, you were talking about younger winemakers, that in many of these same <coughs> vineyards, wineries, um, sort of cleaned up and improved their winemaking technique in the 90s. And I didn't like the wines as well. And some of, it seemed that some of them never came around. But I don't know, do you, do you think there's any uh, fairness in that? In that evaluation? Um, I think in the 90s they were using a bit too much new oak and that tightens Pinot Noir up a, a lot and they were they were playing around they were they were they were trying to get something which might not have been there as uh, Ober de Villain that I said this morning Ober de Villain the Romani Conti asked how the Romani Conti makes such marvelous wines he said we pick the grapes when they're ripe and do nothing <laughs> and Burgundy has become so natural now. There's much less racking in the in the in the cellar. There's less new wood. Um, it, it it really becomes natural. So you, ha you, you you oh you had a question? Sorry. Yeah, uh, going back to economics and also Burgundy, uh, I think it's all wine buyers in this room have been yearly uh, put in stress of like how the price of Burgundy. I just want to curious to your opinion of like is it sustainable and just the general. Economics of what's going on. Well, I mean, I think the wine business is 95% 90, supply and demand. Okay, Burgundies are on a complete roll. The first reason for that is the quality of Burgundy has never been higher. Uh, the second reason is that the demand for Burgundy has never been larger. And so, if you take the worldwide demand for Burgundy, the wines, like the, the Grand Cru, like Musini and Chambertin, and even the Premier Cru, like Gervais Chambertin, Claire Saint-Jacques, the Premier Cru, are getting prices that the world market will pay. Um, and that is just a, a fact of life. However, there are a lot of Burgundies being produced which are not world market potential. So the Coach Islanders this morning, but, I mean, just uh, what we call village wines, Volnay, Pommard, Chassin Montrachet, uh, Beaune, those wines are still affordable because they don't carry the unique USP. Um, whereas Pouline Montrachet, Premier Cru Les Pucelles, is just below Le Montrachet, that is a very high price, probably a hundred pounds a bottle. But a village Pouline Montrachet is probably 35 pounds a bottle. So there's, it's, there's a price for everybody. The price is, once a market gets bid up, it's, the cost of the wines are substantially higher than they were before, and therefore potentially not good value. But that is purely in the eyes of the person paying for it. But there is very good value still in Burgundy, because the wines are so much better than they were. Yeah. I recently read a book called Tasting the Past. Called what? Tasting the Past. Um, it's uh, a book about the forgotten grape varietals around the world, specifically in the Middle East and in places that we would not necessarily think of as wine producing regions. Uh, a lot of the places, apparently, those have been plowed under, neglected, forgotten, etc. And in, in a lot of places in the world, there's a resurgence. I'm just wondering if you're seeing, you know, new grape varietals, um, different places, things that are really kind of coming up that are really different and very surprising because that book made me realize 
that you know there's literally thousands based upon DNA there's thousands of different uh, grapes out there and that some of them are now relegated to you know 20 acres in some obscure place and some of them are getting replanted and finding uh, you know, new customers and uh, a follow-up. And I'm just wondering if you could, if you could be tracking that and if there's any new varietals that are intriguing and interesting to you. I think that's one of the most exciting things of the wine trade today. Um, uh, and it's particularly <coughs> Uh, so in Italy, which has the largest vineyard bank of any country in the world, and you go to Friuli Venezia Giulia, there, there are these vines, grape varieties, which have just been saved. There were maybe <coughs> two rows in somebody's garden, and they've now been propagated, and they're 200 rows. And, um, and to me, I, mean, I wish I was 50 years younger, because that's what I will begin drinking now. Um, and, and I do taste them in my going around on the wine tasting circuit. It is, in my view, the most fascinating thing that's going on in the world of wine. Uh, it's the rediscovery. Uh, there are a few grape varieties being invented, but they're, they're hybrid blends. So um, uh, Marcelin, Marcelin, for instance, is very successful. Uh, I can't quite remember what it is, but it's the reinvention of old, almost forgotten grape varieties, which is fantastic. Torres in Spain is doing it on, on so high slopes, and he calls his selection forgotten grapes, because they had been totally forgotten about. And um, I think that's what's most exciting, because they are, at least what you know about Dorset Pinot Noir is it's Pinot Noir. But in the cases you're talking about, it's a wine that no one has ever even heard about. You would never taste it, therefore you're tasting something entirely new. And I think that's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I'm curious about the non-attendance of the Americans at your tasting in 1976 especially the ones who were in Europe at the same time you had the tasting, and the lack of uh, press coverage other than George Tabor. So could you address? Well, I mean, the, the non-attendance, um, uh, the tasting was done for the nine judges that we invited. We did invite the French press, Le Monde, Le Figaro, Francois, Liberation, those that they were just not interested because they thought taste California wines, there no interest at all. George Tabor was doing a wine course at La Cadre de Vin. He was the head of Time magazine in Paris and the Bureau. He said, if I have a slow day in the office, I'll turn up. He turned up. <laughs> My wife was there to take the photographs. If Bella hadn't been there to take the photographs and George hasn't been there to be there, no one would have talked about it. But that is just the way things happen. Um, but it, it was, there was, um, no, it, it, it was, uh, it wouldn't have occurred to me to invite an American taster because I wanted the wines to be judged by the best palates in France, the best French palates. Well, uh, we'll go up here first in the So, you had tasted, you, you knew French wines well. You had tasted American wines. You were obviously impressed with the caliber of the American wines. And the accounts that I have read said that you were, indicated that you were very surprised by the results. Going into the tasting, did you really think that they would be far apart? Or did you think that they would be competitive? What was your expectation going in, and how shocked were you? My hope would, was that the California wines would get, say, a third and a fifth. A third and a fifth. I, I, there's no winning was just not in my in my conception, and not actually in my interest that California would win against French wines in the country where I lived and worked. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so you, had, you had never tasted them side by side blind before. No, I, I, I put in the I put in the white burgundies and the red Bordeaux as benchmarks 
that the California wine should be judged against, just to see how they matched up. But there's one interesting point, is if that tasting were redone today, or had been redone in the last 20 years, but it was redone actually in London 30 years on, and simultaneously in Napa and in London with the same red wines. But the tasters only had one wine, one glass. So they, they tasted wine one, made their notes, glass taken away, glass comes back, wine two. There was no comparison. And one can't tell how it might have worked out had there been a comparison, because generally in a wine tasting, the first wine you taste gets quite a good mark because it's the first wine of the day. And then you go back, oh, I thought I liked number one, of course I don't like number one, that kind of stuff. <laughs> but, but that's the only, it was just the way it was done at the time. The way we did it in London and, and simultaneously in Napa in, in uh, 2006 was open. I mean, the wines were blind, but you had all the ten wines in front of you. So, yeah. With climate change, how, how have the regions changed with respect to a side-by-side -side tasting? Well, I think it's... Uh, what was so different those days is that California was just trying so hard. Um, the yields were low. They couldn't sell the wines anyway. I said there wasn't a huge market. There was, there was no demand. So they really were seat of the pants, making the best wine they could. And, okay, in 2006, we redid it 30 years on, and California took the first five places, and Ridge came top. Mouton Rothschild has always been the top French wine. We then did an open tasting of much the same wines, and I refused to go into the blind tasting system again. We did an open tasting with much the same wines of the 2000 vintage. And France wiped the floor with California. Those are the conclusion being, which is absolutely true, that in the early 70s, French France was resting on its laurels, and in the 2000s, so was California. And France had fought back. Over de Vilaine, commented on the tasting a few years afterwards and he said a much needed kick in the pants for French wine. A coup dans la derrière. <laughs> so that's it. So I took your picture uh, this morning when, when you were speaking as we kicked off yeah. the event and I posted it on social media. Yeah, yeah. And I said that I got the privilege of listening to Stephen Spurrier, one of the most respected wine men in the world, and I said he's most noted for the judgment of Paris, which I think for Americans is yeah, yeah, probably yeah. true. Through your body of work, what, what are you most proud of? This is a great question, because I always answer it saying I'm most proud of L'Académie du Vin. Uh, having created L'Académie du Vin, which was a wine school, as I said, I wanted it to be called L'Ambassade du Vin, because I felt myself to be a brand ambassador. Uh, no, a wine ambassador, not a wine teacher. Um, but it was indeed a wine school. And to create a wine school in Paris, which had never been done before, that was certainly the thing I'm most proud of. Which brings me to the thing I'm, the thing I'm secondly most proud of, which will mean I have to republish my memoirs with another chapter, the last <laughs> chapter being Poacher Turned Gamekeeper, is the creation of La Canary de Vin Library. And this is a publication venture which I've gone into with four or five colleagues, one of them is Hugh Johnson. And I was disappointed by the sales of my book. And by the time we'd hit, we printed 4,000 copies, by the time we'd hit 2,000 copies after six months, I realized I'd personally sold and signed over 1,000. So my conclusion was that bookstores didn't sell wine books. And we were on Amazon, so Amazon might have sold some, but bookstores did not sell wine books. And therefore I thought about that, and I had lunch with Hugh Johnson, and I said, Hugh, you know, all the wine books coming out now, they're all reference books. And, and basically what is published, either in print or on the web, um, let's say the Wine Advocate, are tasting notes and ranking and scores. It's all about money, it's all, there's nothing about history, there's nothing about people, there's nothing about what we were brought up with. 
and why can't we bring some of these wonderful books back? And he said, that's a brilliant idea. So he then mentioned a couple of friends we knew and they got in the, in the idea. So we founded La Cadre de Library with the intention of never selling to bookshelves and never selling to Amazon. And the first book we published is republished was the commemorative edition of Michael Broadbent's Wine Tasting, which is where it all started. There could have been no Academy de Vin without Michael Broadbent's Wine Tasting. There could have been no Chris's Wine Course. There was Michael Broadbent in 1968, sat down and wrote his book called Wine Tasting, which we reprinted here without changing a single comma. He wrote it in three months just because he wanted to tell people how and why you should taste wine. What we've added, we've updated the vintages, we've added tasting terms in Spanish and Portuguese and Russian and Chinese and Japanese. We haven't changed a single word because nothing has changed in what Michael wrote. It is all absolutely true. What we have added is um, personal comments on Michael by Jancis Robinson, Hugh Johnson, Paul Barker, and myself and Jared Bassett, who last thing he ever wrote before he died. And at the back, we've added about 30 pages on Michael as a Renaissance man, which he was. He played concert standard pianist. He was a great artist. He was also a great lover of women, as his son Bartholomew says in an interview, um, apart from wine, my father's great love was women. He always told about me about that in great detail. He could have taught cousin over a thing or two. <laughs> now, um, you know, this is, these are sides of Michael that the public doesn't know about. I mean, those of you who might, you might have heard of the name, but, but this is the first book we published. The second book we published was Fiona Morrison's Ten Great Wine Founders. They're both there. We're publishing a book on Chateau Musa, the iconic Lebanese winery, uh, and Serge Osha was Decanter's first man of the year, um, God knows, 35, 40 years ago. We're publishing a book on Sherry, the forgotten wine by Ben Harkins. We're recreating something which none of you would have known called The Complete Imbiber, uh, and that was a wonderful miscellany of wine writing going back to Pliny or Horace and everything. We're creating that this year under the title In Vino Veritas and that will be an annual out in time for Christmas. We're going to create first with Musa a series of iconic wineries. We've got Torres will be there, Ernie Lucen who's here today, uh, uh, Eduardo Chadwick. Um, we got lots of plans. We're going to publish five or six books a year. The financing is there, and um, it's going to be a Academy of Art library. And to buy the books, you have to come direct to us, and you can belong to the Academy of Art club. And for people who, in three years' time, people who find out about the Academy of Art library, there will be 15 or 16 or 18 books available, all still in print, because we don't intend our books to go out of print. All still available, and we will single-handedly recreate wine publishing in the world. <laughs> so, so, so have a look at these two books and you'll see the quality of what we're doing. But um, I'm really thrilled about that because it's, it's something, as, as uh, David said, my life in wine has been a rocky ride and, and the chairman of this said, Stephen, just keep on having ideas, stay away from the numbers. <laughs> because, because every time I've got myself involved in anything involving money, it's gone downhill. So, so I'm really thrilled with this. So I, I think it's, uh, you know, it's um, uh, anyway, that's, that's what we, 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 have, uh, we have a lot of hope for. It. We'll, we'll do a book on Opus One, too. I guess. Yeah. Is there a last question? Well, in that case, uh, I think we all join in saying thank you very much for Perfect. today and thank for being you. here for the weekend. Thank you. Thank you and uh, we can follow you out and to the right and if uh, people want to have their book signed, sure. we'll add to the thousand. Yeah. And uh, away we go. But thank you so much. Thank you thank very you much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for coming.